My name is Pat Hannigan. I'm a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel. Um, and this is entitled Homecoming. I returned home from Vietnam in early December, 1967. I'd been the advanced party rear detachment for my company. The company left two weeks before me. I spent those two weeks living in a bunker with a Marine gunnery sergeant, listening to that old TV program, Combat, while the base was constantly rocketing mortar. A clerk ran orders out to me when it was time for me to leave. I got on a chopper. I left so quickly that I never got to say goodbye to buddies who were still there. My footlocker had been shipped home. So all I had was my gear, a duffel and a crossbow um, that I had received as a hail and farewell uh, gift from the battalion command. Chopper dropped me off Queenyon in base ops, just in time for the freedom bird. Out of breath, dirty and hungry, I slept on the plane until our first stop, which is Hawaii. I was supposed to go through customs, but found my way to a bar in the airport instead. My jaw was aching for an impacted wisdom tooth, and I just wanted a drink. After I made it back to the plane, I realized I smelled a bit funky. It had been a few weeks since I had the luxury of a shower, and I'd been wearing the same fatigues for almost as long. I kept to myself and anxiously awaited our next stop, Seattle. When we finally arrived, we got off the plane and onto buses with our gear. We're told that we could stay the night, get a clean uni, steak and eggs dinner, or the bus would take us directly to SeaTac Airport. I chose the airport and 30 days leave starting immediately. I bought a first class ticket home to New York City, called my wife and told her where and when I would arrive. As I boarded the plane, the stewardess looked at me and my ticket and said, no way. She took my crossbow, its string had to be cut, and then sat me in the back of the plane, away from other passengers. A major boarded after I was seated. The stewardess sat him next to me. About an hour outside of New York City, the major woke me up. He asked me if I was carrying any weapons. He noticed my 45. Before we landed, I took four frag grenades, my cave bar, two full mags and placed them in the seat pocket in front of me. That's probably a big surprise for whoever cleaned the plane, but I refused to part ways with my 45. I left the plane hungry, scrubby, disheveled and anxious. As I walked down the runway, I saw my wife approaching. She walked right by without recognizing me. Must have been the mustache, the distended jaw from the wisdom tooth and my general ugliness. We did finally get together and the ride home was a bit awkward, but quickly softened. After I returned home from Vietnam, my wife and I had lived with my in-laws while I looked for work. They and my parents never asked about my experiences. On one hand, I appreciated not talking about it, but I was also frustrated because I knew I could never explain how I was feeling beyond telling war stories. In Tim O'Brien's book, The Things They Carried, he notes that in any war story, but especially a true one, it's difficult to separate what happened from what seemed to happen. After returning, my friends and colleagues kept asking me how it was in Vietnam. They still do. My response is more sarcastically considered now. I no longer try to get them to understand. While my wife and I were living with the in-laws, I was desperate to get a job and to get on with my life and out of a parental nest. I finally settled on a position of autopsy prosector at Pittsfield Medical Center, Massachusetts. I'd seen enough death and I'd feel it would bother me and knew I would be working alone with little supervision. In PCVI, we read Sebastian Younger's book, Tribe. In it, he writes, veterans often come home to find that although they're willing to die for their country, they're not sure how to live for it. It's hard to know how to live for a country that regularly tears itself apart along every possible ethnic and demographic boundary. It's complete madness 
and the veterans know this. In combat, soldiers all but ignore differences of race, religion, and politics. It's no wonder many of them get so depressed when they get home. I understand that completely. My wife and I had moved to a duplex in the city, tried to settle into being a married couple. But the questions and side eye continued at the hospital job. My depression increased. I talked to a recruiter about going back in. When I spoke to my wife about the possibility, she gave me a firm no. It was non-negotiable. I began interviewing for different jobs. But interviews didn't go well. One in particular stands out. I was interviewing for a pharmaceutical sales job and the interviewer, interviewer had a problem with my resume. Most of my experience was my military career at that time. The interviewer stopped short of calling me a baby killer. I had the gall to ask me how many people I'd killed. I got up and walked out. I quit my job at the hospital and found an interim job as a teacher until I could find my way out of the morass I felt myself in. I lucked out. I fell in love with teaching and was so busy that my thoughts fell away. The depression lifted. I had my life back. And I told myself that Vietnam in the afternoon was all behind me. PCVI has shown me that my baggage never left. My bad decisions could easily be traced back to actions and behaviors in my past. I was fortunate to find a counselor, my Episcopal pastor, to talk to, who taught me to forgive myself and pointed me in a positive direction. My wife has stayed with me through the good times and the bad for 55 years, and I bless every day we've shared. Service to the community was my salvation. Teaching, Rotary Club, volunteer work, helping neighbors. Those of us who have lived over three quarters of a century know that we're playing the back nine. Expo exposure to Agent Orange has left a lingering memory of those bygone days in my body. I'm sure it will cut short my future. But the distress, anxiety, guilt, and and sorrow are quieter now and peace constantly soothes my mind thank you thank you pat so pat you have the crossbow there right right here there's been, there's been a request for a uh, photograph <laughs> it's a beauty 